Uh, as I pointed out during the morning session, uh, in the morning we focused quite a lot on the problems and uh, now during the afternoon we will talk a bit more about what we can actually do about all these issues as well. Uh, first speaker in the afternoon is Dr. Jacqueline O... No, sorry. Yes, it is. Dr. Jacqueline Alder, uh, the head of Marine and Coastal Ecosystem Branch within the Division of environmental policy implementation in UNEP, based in Nairobi. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, your current work is focused on blue carbon, special planning and ecosystem adaption. Uh, to start, could you please tell me, and maybe there are more out here who haven't heard about the concept of blue carbon before. Just a brief introduction. Okay. Yeah. Um, Blue carbon is just a term we use to refer to the carbon that's captured in marine and coastal ecosystems and to try and uh, use it as a bit of a flagship word to gain interest and generate interest in um, agencies in terms of uh, looking towards a financing mechanism. Uh, we have the RED program for forests and we thought we would try and flagship it with a, a color as well and we chose blue, blue for oceans. Anyway, and... Um, I thought I'd let my talk focus around this whole concept of blue carbon that we're developing at UNEP uh, amongst um, other partners, including IMO and to a lesser extent FAO. Um, it's an initiative we started in 2000 and, uh, 2008, and in 2009, um, just before COP15, we released this report, Blue Carbon. I brought, uh, or had some copies uh, sent over and unfortunately they've gone, but um, if anybody's interested on where to download this report on the website, um, I can easily give you that website address and you can download the full report. It's a PDF file. Anyway, um, just wanted to thank the organizers, CETA, who have, are um, big supporters of the uh, programs that we have here at UNEP, and uh, also like to thank the organizing committee for um, inviting us to present uh, Blue Carbon. Hopefully um, you'll find it an interesting talk. Uh, Right. Okay. Um, the speakers this morning have, have talked about the um, services that marine and coastal ecosystems provide, and in particular, um, the services they provide for climate regulation. I'd just like to further emphasize that, um, you know, the, the fact that we can live on planet Earth is, is almost all in part the fact that we have oceans and we have bodies of water that absorb heat and that move that heat around, and so that you have your nice warm um, Gulf Stream that warms up the uh, northern Europeans in the winter and we have the cold currents of the Humboldt, for example, that keep temperatures cool around Chile and support a really vibrant uh, fishery. And they also um, play a, a role in carbon capture and cycling, which I'm not going to dwell on because the speakers this morning emphasized that point and that's the point at which we've taken off in UNEP to try and generate interest in preserving uh, or better management of marine ecosystems and coastal ecosystems. Because if we, um, if we look at the amount of carbon that is absorbed or captured and cycled in marine and coastal ecosystems, it's actually quite significant. It may not be um, necessarily the same sort of systems that are on terrestrial systems like the Amazonian forest, but when you consider that um, oceans cover more than 70% of the world's Earth's surface and you look at how much carbon is cycled and, and keeps our planet uh, hab hab habitable, it does play an important role in terms of uh, just the fact that nearly 55% of all green carbon is captured by li living organisms in the oceans and not on land. Um, you know, that's a big figure. That's a lot of carbon that's captured. And so we tend to forget that when we're talking about um, climate change and, and especially mitigation. We think of only forests as being the real key to mitigating uh, the impacts of climate change and we've totally, or uh, up until recently, we've almost ignored the, the role of oceans. And I just wanted to emphasize that um, when we talk about blue carbon, we're not talking about acidification, but in fact we're talking about mitigating and hopefully trying to <coughs> reduce the impact of acidification. This diagram here is just to give you an idea of the uh, scale of, or the differences between uh, the ability or the potential for these different ecosystems to capture carbon. Um, this is represents the open ocean and the deep sea, um, which is a big um, capture or a sink, but it's, it's a short-lived one, and I'll explain it in a minute. 
We have estuaries, seagrasses, mangroves, salt marshes, and the continental shelf itself. And um, all of them capture a, a differing amounts of, of carbon, but nevertheless, um, they do play a role. Mangroves probably um, are, ver are, are very big potential, and um, we've recently made sure that the uh, managing mangroves can also be taken under the RED program so that they do get inclu included in forests as well. So we, we're trying to put our feet in both camps uh, for that aspect. But um, in terms of blue carbon, there's actually two stories. One is, is this sort of uh, long-term burial concept that, that's used right now for the RED uh, program for carbon ca uh, capture for uh, forest systems where, um, are most people familiar with the RED program? Okay, just my one step back. Um, RED stands for Reduced Emissions from Degradation and Deforestation, and it's a program that's um, available to, it's just started over the last two years to provide a financing mechanism for countries that don't degrade their forest and don't chop down their forest to get some, generate some sort of income from preserving their forests. And it's, uh, Norway is a big contributor to it and there are millions and millions of dollars available to developing countries to enable them to, to take advantage of this financial incentive. Um, and, but that's based on the fact that f uh, trees store carbon for a long time, uh, 40, 50, 60 years, depending on where you are in the, on the Earth's surface, if it's tropical or temperate. But still, there are much longer term storage uh, component and, and so there is an incentive for people to invest in, um, you know, paying their uh, carbon offset credits, for example, on forests because you know those stands will be there for a long time. And they're also fairly easy to manage in terms of satellite imagery. You can, you know, fly over an area and you can find out whether they've cut or, or haven't cut their trees. Um, and so that's one market that's, that's developing rapidly and that um, has lots of potential. And we have a similar, or a similar potential at least, in blue carbon in our coastal ecosystems like mangroves, salt marshes, and to a lesser extent seagrass beds. W and I, I put the emphasis on potential because it's just really early days in this sort of uh, work that we're doing. But then there's also a second story, and I think it just as an important story, is the fact that the open ocean and much of the uh, sort of open water acts as a pump or a flow, and it keeps the carbon in, in suspension, for want of a better term, so that this carbon that's being captured that was described this morning by others actually only resides or is only in the suspension or captured for a short time. But what's important is that the water quality and the, the system itself needs to be at peak efficiency or operating at peak efficiency for that pump to continue to, to cycle carbon. It's, um, it's a hard to, uh, concept to describe, but it's like if we don't keep this pump going efficiently, the system will fall down and we'll start to see even more increased acidification. We'll see um, other systems starting to fail or to slow down, those sorts of things. So I think there are two stories. One is, is this sort of red-like story, and then there's a new one, which is, is different. It would have a different financing mechanism, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But that's one that we would encourage or try and find financial mechanisms for big ocean states to think about how they can better manage their marine and, e and coastal ecosystems to enable this pump to, to operate a, at peak efficiency. And um, this is one area that um, UNEP is leading on and that we hope to be able to lead, but we realize that this is a long-term project. Um, if you look at the experience of RED, it took uh, 15 to 20 years to get that actually into uh, the current state of being a financial mechanism. Anyway, just to give you some idea of what this potential we're talking about is um, mangroves, a potential right now of about uh, one ton of carbon per hectare per year on average. Um, salt marshes, slightly more. Seagrasses, um, a little bit less than mangroves. And open ocean are very small. But when you look at the square kilometers, uh, millions of square kilometers, there is actually a lot of potential if we can manage it properly. So um, it may not be as, as great as the Amazon, but um, you know, considering what um, the speakers talked about this morning and how close we are or how, how close we may be getting to the precipice, it might be worth taking a look at every, every possible source of uh, mitigation. So the other thing to note is that, and um, you know, the speakers this morning talked about coral reefs and, and how they're, they're heading towards um, a fairly degraded state and, and maybe extinct or, or certainly severely uh, reduced in, by 2050. 
We have other systems that are disappearing as well, not necessarily directly as a result of climate change, but of development. Mangroves are being converted to other land uses, uh, infilling of, of coastal systems for uh, harbors, ports, uh, those so sorts of things. So we're seeing some of those uh, systems disappearing faster than any other ecosystems on the planet, and some of them, like coral reefs, could be gone in, in just decades. But the nice, story, the nice part of this story is that restoration and management are possible. Um, we're not too late. We can still rehabilitate and, and restore many of these systems. Maybe not coral reefs, but then again, coral reefs are not a, a net consumer or a net sink for um, carbon. But certainly, the restoration and management rehabilitation options provide a very cost-effective uh, investment for trying to, to uh, manage and capture carbon. And not only that, they have multiple benefits. Um, they provide jobs, food security especially, um, opportunities for business. And um, in coastal systems, if you improve water quality, you see an improvement in, in uh, human health. And so while mitigating climate change, we can also have these multiple benefits and move towards a green economy, which is one of the areas that UNEP is trying to promote. Um, to some of the multiple benefits, just to, as an example, um, they did some restoration work in Vietnam for uh, um, an area of, of uh, channels to try and um, uh, help with erosion control. And rather than building um, artificial and very channel type uh, system in, in one local government area. They opted to restore the mangroves and rehabilitate them. And what they found was that not only did they control um, floods, but they also found that um, within two years their fish catches in increased because these mangroves have provided nursery habitats and enhanced the fisheries and also improved the uh, local water quality and, and saw an improvement in human health. So. For an investment to in, in mangroves, they had multiple benefits, not just financial, but also human health and food security wise. And they saved in the long term because they didn't use um, channelization, et cetera. They don't have the long term maintenance costs of trying to maintain something like a seawall or a series of concrete um, channels. So in the, in the long run, they've benefited. So the question we have at UNEP is that given this potential for um, capturing carbon in, in marine ecosystems, is there a market? And we argue that perhaps there is. If you look at a country like Indonesia, um, it's got a very, very big uh, content, uh, EEZ area. And if there was a market of just $1 per kilometer squared per year for sound management of oceans, Indonesia could generate $3.6 million. And in a country like Indonesia, where I've spent many years working, you could go a long way with that. You could easily pay for the, a department to manage its resources. You could pay to compensate some of the fishermen for, for not fishing, et cetera. That would go a long way. And Indonesia is, a, is one of the countries with some of the largest stands of mangroves. If you add that in the red scheme, you have even more money to, to look at uh, using to manage your systems much better. But Indonesia may be sort of at one end of the spectrum. Um, if you take a look at Nauru, a small Pacific island, way out in the middle of nowhere, has no real resource base, has no mangroves, maybe a bit of seagrass, a bit of coral reef, very isolated, doesn't have a tourism industry really to draw on. But it does have tuna fisheries agreements, but those agreements generate about 10% of the value of the, of the tuna catch, which mo results in maybe a couple of million dollars a year if they're lucky. But if you gave them also uh, $1 per kilometer squared annually, that would generate 300000 and in a place like Nauru, that would easily manage, be sufficient resources for them to manage their fisheries, as well as their inshore coastal waters where they have um, depleted their reef resources. And so again, you could still do it. We could add value to the resource base, certainly improve their food security, and also pay for their management costs. So we think that there is some scope for it. We're not saying it's necessarily going to be like a red system. But we also know that that we need to do some more work. We need to do our homework. Um, what we found when we went to uh, COP15 last year in Copenhagen with this concept that we need to get the research and the work that we're doing linked much more tightly to the IPCC process. If you don't have it in that process, governments don't want to know about it. We also need to strengthen the existing mechanisms to maintain and restore the carbon pump. Um, if we look at the water quality figures, the amount of uh, habitat that's being converted, um, you know, 
those sorts of things, the balance sheet isn't great. We're still at a loss. And so we need to put some effort in to maintaining those mechanisms at least so that if we do get into a financial situation, we can capitalize on that early. And we need to start now to look at how we would develop some sort of um, carbon offset credit scheme. Um, one of the things that the REDS uh, process identified was that the sooner, if they had have gotten into this system earlier, they could have probably saved some time in, in getting money flowing um, for maintaining forests. Some of the research that's needed is those figures that I presented to you, some of them are based on a very few set of studies in, in a very few place, uh, areas of the world. And so what we need to do is to be able to give some degree of uh, I wouldn't, uh, variation for the financial markets is we need to understand how variable um, is the carbon sequestration that happens between latitudes and between geographic areas. Um, we know that forest, you know, carbon that's captured in trees in the temperate uh, zone is much different than the carbon captured in, in the tropical zone, and we need to understand those differences as well in marine systems. Um, we also need to better understand the whole notion of how carbon is cycled in the oceans. Um, although we've been looking at oceans for, for centuries, our actual understanding of what's being cycled in terms of carbon is much less than what's understood in terrestrial systems, especially forests. And uh, we also need to have better estimates of the ex aerial extent of, of these um, habitats. For example, we've only just in the last year understood uh, with some degree of accuracy how extensive mangroves actually are distributed throughout the world. And uh, we know even less about these other ecosystems that I've talked about, such as seagrass and salt marshes. And also the role of fisheries and aquaculture in the storage of, of carbon, and hopefully um, Eddie can give us some inf insights into that. Um, but we do know that from recent research that um, you know fisheries cycle carbon, and if you look at the biomass of fish in the world, they do have a potential store for carbon. But we do have existing mechanisms. Unlike the red system, um, which didn't really have many sort of uh, governance platforms, in the marine realm we're actually um, well advanced in that. We have uh, various conventions, protocols, and codes of practice that would enable us to provide some of the mechanisms that we would need to be able to um, embed a finance mechanism. So for those of you familiar with the Helicom Convention, there's a land-based sources of pollution protocol. Why can't we uh, you know, give credit to a country that's implementing the protocol, reducing land-based sources of pollution, and ensuring that their water quality is, is up to scratch? That's one mechanism. We already have that in place, and it wouldn't be that much work to actually embed a financing mechanism or use that as a mechanism to monitor and control a finance system. The red system didn't have that. <coughs> we, we at least are, are ahead of the game on that. We also have, uh, or we're developing tools for assessing the trade-offs in maintaining these, these carbon sinks and pumps versus other uses. So is it better for a country to allow someone to fish you know, beyond its biological limits but get a lot of money? Or is it better if we give them a dollar per kilometer to manage those fisheries resources better? We need those tra trade-off tools to, to enable countries to make those decisions. And if we are quickly learning lessons from other carbon offset schemes. Um, one of them in particular that I've mentioned is the RED program, and we're looking at how we can incorporate mangroves into that program. And for a blue carbon fund, what is needed? Um, we need to find out how we can get a carbon credit scheme up and running. Um, we need to establish baselines and ways of measuring how uh, much ca carbon is captured, stored, and how do we monitor that in a fairly efficient way. Um, we need to look at how we can coordinate and um, manage these funding mechanisms amongst the different agencies that might be interested. But most of all, we need to pr prioritize a sustainable, integrated, and ecosystem-based management of both coastal zones and ocean systems. Um, we need to try and at least, as soon as possible, get on top of managing these areas that are, um, as we've seen this morning, for example, coral reefs uh, still degrading and in some cases degrading rapidly. And with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you very much, Eglin. Uh, you mentioned, uh, please stay up here on stage, just a few more seconds. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you mentioned the multiple benefits concerning some of these projects. Yeah. Uh, I would like to know if you could give some more uh, example of how it can contribute to sustainable development of coastal communities. Um, well, most of the examples that I have are from the tropics, but um, you know, decisions made not to convert, for example, mangroves to shrimp ponds. Um, there have been some studies that have shown that if, if um, you don't, the, the benefits of uh, 10 years of shrimp production in a pond are quickly um, counterbalanced by the multiple years of good fisheries uh, catches, um, sustainable harvest of those mangroves to provide charcoal for fuel um, and furniture, those sorts of things. So there have been studies done where, where there's been decisions not to develop a particular area for, for shrimp production, for example, because they've realized that over the long term it will be better to keep those habitats intact and in fact invest in better management of them. So there are lots of examples in the developing world at least of where uh, when you've been able to get into a local community and demonstrate these benefits, um, they usually realize that, that it is a better option and, and go for it. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, we're seeing that more and more. Yeah. Thank you very much Jacqueline will be with us during the panel discussion as well.